Welcome everyone to another OpenShift Commons briefing. And today, very excited, we have Miguel here. You know, he has been working on and the engineer with the engineering teams on these migration toolkits. And we're so excited for this migration toolkit for virtualization. Uh, it's definitely been long awaited. Uh, Miguel, do you want to introduce yourself and talk to us about migration? Sure. Sure. Well, my name is Miguel Perez Colino. I'm I'm a product manager. I'm the product manager for Migration Toolkit for Virtualization, and I'm in the my modernization and migration team in Red Hat. And um, well, I'm taking care of this tool that has reached beta stage just last week, and uh, was like, okay, I have to go to OpenShift Commons to show it. So we are going. Okay. So, first things first, OpenShift, containers and VMs. So, the migration toolkit for virtualization is intended to move uh, virtual machines from initially from VMware to OpenShift, and then in the future we'll add more sources and we'll keep the same target. And the target is OpenShift virtualization. So, what is this about, you know? So, this is saying, you know, containers are not virtual machines. And another saying that goes containers are Linux, and Linux is containers. So the containers is a way to isolate process. It's like a super isolated process using kernel namespaces, uh, C groups, and, and SE Linux in, in behind the price Linux to be able to isolate those processes very, very well. And, uh, and well, virtual machines require web guest OS and an I hypervisor running. But the thing is that, you know, in, in Linux, a virtual machine is also a process. And we could encapsulate that process. And, and the thing is that the operating system, Linux, has uh, the kernel virtual machine, which is like an engine to be able to run virtual machines, which is used like in almost every public cloud for, for virtualization purposes. And the thing is like, well, this is very performant. Try to think what, 1% increase in performance would mean to a public cloud. So try to understand that, I mean, this is like a super, super good uh, engine for virtual machines. And it's included in Linux, it's included in Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Core OS that they use in same kernel with same KVM. So we could leverage that and all the experience we have in, in rehabilitation and OpenStack to be able to build a virtual machine capability on, on OpenShift. So, this is how we get to OpenShift virtualization. What is OpenShift virtualization? Well, we have adapted uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift to be able to run virtual machines. So we created the project KubeVirt two years ago, and uh, no, three years ago, if I recall correctly, and uh, KubeVirt matured and became pretty solid. And then one year ago in April, 2020, we released OpenShift virtualization, and now it's available to run uh, machines, virtual machines in OpenShift next to your containers with all the benefits that brings uh, being able to run something on, on, on Kubernetes, you know, like this declarative way of uh, deploying infrastructure, all the operational benefits with Prometheus to gather metrics and all those benefits that, you know, uh, and love from OpenShift plus the, the interfaces to network and storage that OpenShift has been developed for so long. So that's good, but what is what is this for? You know, it's, it's all about modernization and migration. You know, customers and users worldwide and developers, they all want to, to become more modern because it brings a lot of benefits. So when, when development teams start using containers, they become more agile, faster, they have a lower, time to market, they release more frequently, in case there's an incidence, their time to restore is reduced. There are these metrics that are, uh, we all know that get improved when you start working in a, in a cloud native way. So what if we could move these workloads that would make sense to have next to containers into OpenShift and have them next to the containers so they could behave uh, more, more like you are in a container, and then over time, uh, uh, modernize them. So it's a lower friction way 
to bring those VMs into a container-like world and uh, have one converged infrastructure for those uh, critical uh, workloads that we're going to manage and then be able to do all that low modernization process step by step uh, um, during during the time. So what are we thinking? What if we could automatically convert VMware images to KVM images on OpenShift? Well, that would lower the cost of migrating the workloads. Okay, so that's a, a direct benefit of this. So what would this look like? So let's say we have these uh, web logics with Apache front ends and a database running on VMware. We could move them to virtual machines and then modernize, for example, the Apaches. They are pretty easy and then put those Apaches in containers or even change it for Nginx and then be able to, okay, all those front ends, make them, uh, drive them to containers. Then we could move to, for example, take some application from WebLogic to JBoss or keep them in WebLogic on containers. That's something you could also do on OpenShift, running WebLogic in containers, same as WebSphere, JBoss. But in this case, let's, let's, let's think, okay, we're going to move this application to JBoss. Let's modernize the application. Let's make it, uh, leaner and more standards oriented so it can run on JBoss. So we are modernizing that. And then we could end up modernizing all the applications and even moving the database into containers at some point in time. So this makes a, a very easy uh, iterative approach to modernization. It's a really good way for you to be able to, as I say, first shift the, the workloads into virtual machines and then do the modernization at your own pace. How do we approach this? Well, you have the workloads and there are some strategic workloads and some not strategic workloads that you could analyze with, uh, well, assess with Pathfinder and analyze with migration toolkit for applications. And well, what can you do? You could replatform them uh, as VMs, you know? So you just move them uh, whenever they are VMs as VMs, whenever they are containers as containers. You could refactor them and repackage them as containers. So you modernize the application. You could repurchase if it's a third party application and then put them in OpenShift project. So you test them in OpenShift. Oh, they are good. They're not good. We fix. Then we test it. They are good. Once they are good, you deploy to production on OpenShift and then you're modernizing. What if we want to further enhance? Well, we could go to the refactor loop again and improve, improve, improve. So this is, for example, a pattern that we have seen with large monoliths that you split them and you modernize them, modernize them, modernize them. And then modernization is complete. What do you do with the non-strategic workloads? Well, retire, rehost, retain. So some of them you could retire them, some of them you could rehost them, some of them you could retain. The, the retire has like a, a second fold, like for example, if you're running your own email process, probably you want to move it as software as a service. So there are several options for the non-strategic workloads that are could be provided as a service that you could consider working on. So we are working mostly on the replatform, refactor, and reports, focused on replatform and refactor. For migration token for virtualization, it's fully replatform to move VMs from VMware to OpenShift virtualization. What are the benefits and the operating costs? Well, you see there are more operating costs in a rehost or retain because you have to keep your current uh, infrastructure. Uh, if you retire, it's pretty easy, but you lose some services. And then when you do replatform, there's more business benefit. And when you do refactor, there are even more business benefits that you could obtain by doing this this move. So what do we do in in my team? <laughs> well, we have tools for these cases. In Rehouse, we have a tool called uh, MTC, Migration Token for Containers, that the upstream project is called Crane. Um, then for the replatform, we could move containers using move to queue that will bring the, the containers running on Cloud Foundry to, to OpenShift and forklift, which is the upstream for the migration toolkit for virtualization to move VMs into, into OpenShift virtualization as VMs. And then the refactor, you have the Pathfinder and Windup projects that uh, will result into the migration toolkit for applications. These are the migration toolkits and then you will be able to analyze and assess the applications to be able to first, to, with the assessment, be able to choose which applications to work first, and then with the analysis tool, be able to, to start transforming them 
to put them uh, in uh, in containers. About the tool, any questions so far? Is there anything on chat? Uh, not yet. This is awesome. Keep going. Oh, okay. I have lots of. Okay, I keep going. So, what I said, we have these projects in the upstream. Uh, there's, this upstream is, is conveyor.io project. I really suggest you to visit it. If you go to github.com slash conveyor, you will find all the projects that we put in there. Some of them are still not migrated. This is like pretty fresh, pretty new. So we suggest you to go there. There are like uh, mailing lists, there are forums, and we, we even have some meetups to show like the inner links and all the technical stuff on the projects and be able to to help everybody to join and be able to contribute. So you see this project, Crane, Forklift, and Tackle. Crane, then we have the downstream, which is the tool that we provide the migration token for containers to migrate from OpenShift 3 to 4, and also from 4 to 4. So in this case that you have a cluster that uh, is getting full and you want to move some applications outside of it, and your pipelines uh, are not that easy to, to re repurpose, then you could use MTC easily to move those those containers and their uh, persistent volumes easily from one cluster to another. Then you have Tackle, which is, becomes the migration token for applications, as I said, to assess and analyze applications. So you could analyze the applications, Java applications, with this tool, and it will tell you, okay, you have these things in the application, like for example, you're using a proprietary logger, or you have Windows uh, specific paths, or you're using a, a, a proprietary class from the Oracle JDK, and you want to move to Open JDK. Well, you can use MTA, the migration token for applications, for that. And what I'm going to talk about is the migration token for virtualization. So, what does it do? It's prepared to do migration at scale of virtual machines to OpenShift virtualization. So, we have built tools before to do migration on scale, and we have used those tools before to do migration at scale. So thousands of VMs have been migrated, and now we are building this tool with all the lessons learned from the previous tools that we've built, but with the target for, that the target is going to be OpenShift virtualization. So you can mass migrate virtual machines to OpenShift virtualization. Where are we now? Well, the beta is out, so it's very easy for you if you are on OpenShift to be able to install it, and I will demo it in, uh, in some minutes. About the architecture, everything OpenShift, everything container native, everything in, in containers. So we are using all the natives that we can. You see that we have a source, which in this case is VMware vSphere. And uh, during this year, we'll be adding rehabilitation and OpenStack as sources. So just in case you want to move VMs from these sources to OpenShift virtualization. We have a, an inventory service that is going to gather all the information from VMware vSphere. And we have a validation service that is going to check, okay, how is this VM configured? And it's going to, do, to run checks there. And if something is not right, it will raise it and will say, hey, I found this that could be an inconvenience to migrate this VM into OpenShift virtualization. So you do not start a migration that could fail, okay? So maybe you need to check things like raw device mappings that are attached to the VM and that you want to keep as raw device mappings or that uh, two VMs are sharing a disk and you don't want to end up with two VMs with two disks, but two VMs with one single disk that is attached to both of them. These kind of things are the ones that are checked before. So the migration is run as smoothly as possible. So we are adding more and more rules to the validation service to ensure that when you migrate a VM uh, is going to be as successful as possible. Then we have the user interface, of course, uh, built with Pattern Fly 4. I love the Pattern Fly project. It makes, pro it makes our, our interfaces look so nicely. And the thing is that we try to make it as simple and nice as possible to be able to be used, uh, even if it's powerful, try to make it really simple and nice to, to use. And what do we have in there? We have mappings to be able to map resources from source to target. We have migration plans to be able to say, okay, which VMs are going to be migrated in the same batch, and then we have the migration run to execute the migration. And then, of course, there's the controller, and then there's a capability to import VMs in OpenShift virtualization that we leverage to be able to, to move it, and then, of course, the import operator that is handled by it. So this is the architecture. Uh, if you want to have another session with more technical details, uh, we can invite my friend 
uh, Fabian Dupont, and we could have another session to talk about the internal. What else? Okay, providers. First thing, we need to connect source and target. So we have a provider that is the sources. Right now, VMware is here, and we have the target that is OpenShift virtualization. So you have to connect the tool to the provider, which would be VMware vSphere, provide the credentials, and also to the target. When you deploy a migration token for virtualization, the OpenShift instance in which you deploy it, it gets configured automatically as a target. So very easy. If you want to do a simple migration, it's going to be very straightforward for you. So we use the sources, the destination. So we have, okay, this is from where to where. So, and now how? How do we change what it is already there? So normally, what you have in the source is a set of configured networks. Okay, normally attached to v, to VLANs, uh, on, depending on how you configure it, but it's pretty common that you have a certain a set of VLANs that you attach to your virtualization network that one of them is, for example, to access the storage, another one is for administration, another one is internal, another one is the DMC to be able to publish services outside of of your environment. So these are the network mappings, the network configuration that you have in your source, and you have to create the mappings. Now you have to do it. So what you do is that you deploy your new environment, your OpenShift environment, and you configure these networks in OpenShift. So you, once you have configured the networks, if you could exp extend the VLANs, it will be a lot easier. Then it's, it's very simple. You just take one VM from source to target, and it will be connected to the exactly the same network it was in the source. If not, of course, you can always change the addressing, but I mean, if you can extend the, the networking configuration, it will be the easiest way to do it. So with this, we can map the networks in the source to the networks in the target and be able to make them equivalent. So whenever you choose a VM that has an interface connected to a network in the source, the VM that we will create in the target will have an interface connected to the same network, well, the equivalent network, in the target. If you have configured properly, it will be exactly the same net. So this is a very simple way not to have to be changing everything every time you move a VM. This is intended for mass migration. With the storage, we do something very similar. You have your storage configuration with your data stores in your VMware environment, and you have your storage configuration with your storage classes in, in OpenShift. So it's very important to select the storage in the source similar to the storage in the target. So the storage in the source, sometimes you're using, I don't know, NFS, iSCSI, sometimes even fiber channel, depending on the IO that you're going to require. And then in the target, you have something like uh, Ceph, for example, or you have another iSCSI provider or an NFS provider that you have configured as a, as a storage class, but you can allocate uh, persistent volumes automatically. So you map A to B. This data store is going to be mapped to this uh, storage class in the target. So whenever you start migrating, a disk is going to be created in the target, which is due to the mapping equivalent to the source. This way we map source and target, and we make it very easy to perform a mass migration. Any questions so far? Okay, I keep going. Please interrupt me if, if, if there's any question coming in in the chat or if you want to, to ask anything. So next step, so we have the maps, we create the migration plan. This is where we select the VMs. Of course, we have all the ways to filter the VMs uh, to, to make it easy to, to select the VMs that we want. In many, in many customers that I've uh, visited and met and worked with, uh, they have like their own, their own name in the structure. So, Filtering by VM name is usually very, very common, very easy. But if you want to choose also the data center or filter by cluster, it's very easy to filter the VMs and get a set of VMs that you want to migrate together. So let's say that you filter it, you get like 20, 25 VMs to be migrated, you select them, and then you uh, assign the network mapping. Of course, it will check that the, the network uh, in the VM selected is in the network mappings, and it will not, it will, it will warn you. You can choose the storage mapping, same thing, to be able to do that. You will review the plan and you will be able to execute on it. Of course, we want to add, uh, not in this version, but in the next one, migration automation. 
which is sometimes when, when you want to do a migration, before doing the migration, you want to deactivate monitoring for that VM, or if the VM is part of a cluster that is redirected from a load balancer to detach that VM from the load balancer or make changes in the DNS. So you could automate all the process before the migration and then after the migration, re-engage with monitoring, reattach the VM to, to the load balancer or perform any changes that you would like to, to do, do it. So this way we ensure that all the tasks that you want to do during the migration could be done. It's not going to be ready for the 2.0, but it's going to come in the next versions. And then, of course, we'll be able to monitor the migration prod, progress, uh, cancel. Who doesn't like a progress bar, right? So we are we already we already include a progress bar a way to monitor how things are going. And then a bit more about roadmaps. Where we stand, as I said, we released last week the beta with the uh, capabilities to do mass migration, and we are preparing in May to launch the GA with warm migration. This is pretty interesting because the data in the VM will be copied without powering down the VM. And then when you want to perform the last step of the migration, do some down the VM, copy the delta, and then power up the VM in the target to reduce the time required for the migration. We normally, uh, for this kind of migrations, there's a, an intervention window required. And first, we want the intervention window to be the shortest possible. And second, we want to make the most of that intervention window, which normally is not at, at regular times. So we are looking forward to helping our, our friends, our sysadmins out there uh, when they're doing their migrations so they could make the most of their migration windows. Also, the pre-migration checks to be able to check the VMs before doing migration to detect potential compatibility issues before migrating. What else? Well, any if you have any other questions, comments, contributions, any suggestion, anything you want to tell us, I mean, we have this email, migrate at redhat.com. Please use it. Please send us your, your questions. Please send us your suggestions. And if you have any doubt, of course, uh, share it with us and, and let us know. Because, I mean, the whole team is here listening to to help you. So we have this email for you to to be able to contact us. And that would be it. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to show it to you if, if I may. May I? Uh, of course. We do have a couple questions if you want to take a Oh, great. Break. Nice. Tell me. So let's go ahead and uh, get some questions answered before you dive into the Demo. I'm really excited to see the demo, though. Um, all right. So, <laughs> vCenter version 6x and above. Um, do you support vCenter 6x and above? Yes, we support. Uh, what we test is 6.5 and above. And, and we normally, uh, what we use underneath is uh, VDDK from VMware. So we behave like any other backup. A software. So what we do is that we connect just like any other backup software using VMware certified mechanism to do backup, which is using BDDK. And we are using this BDDK to extract the data. And the current supported BDDK, it's only supported for 6.5. However, we know that this is uh, backwards compatible and that uh, and that you could use it to 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 access any other previous version of, of VMware. So you could run it, but we know, I mean, we we, should, we we say this is what we test. And if you want to use it for something else, of course you can do it, but uh, just letting people know what we are testing. And if they have any issues, they contact you at migrate at redhat.com or yes. also the conveyor.io community? Would that be? Okay? Yes. These are the, the places to contact us. You can go to the conveyor.io community and, and open 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 your your bug your oh I was trying to open it but it's not working right now. Seems that my DNS is not working well. So yeah, you can go to conveyor and 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 just join the Slack channels that we have on the Kubernetes environment. So you could go to Slack k8s.io.com.io.io 
And in that Slack channel, I mean, there are channels uh, that say MTB, Migration Token for Virtualization. You can join it and you can, of course, tell us there how is it going and, and propose your suggestions. So any of these channels is good to contact us. Nice. During your demo, I'll pull up the, the link to the um, to that Slack. Um, also, are you able to share storage between your target VMs that are running in Kubert? Are you able to share storage between the target VMs running on Kubert? Okay, so this is more an, an operation virtualization question. So I, I'm not completely up to date on the status of shared storage of operation virtualization, so I don't want to say something that is wrong. But I mean, you could check in the in the documentation of operation virtualization, the official documentation, and it will stay there. So or ask yeah, well, that Slack channel, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the Slack channel, um, I'll say. Let's see. I'm assuming this only works for supported VM infrastructures. Are there any limits from where the VMs can come from? Can I import from multiple types of infrastructure, for example, Rev or Azure, at the same time? So we built a provider for VMware to be able to import for from VMware. And we are working in building another provider for rehabilitation. And by the end of the year, we can, we want to work on another, adding another provider. But of course, if somebody wants to try to build his or her own provider for Azure, Amazon or whatever, and they want to share it in the community, I mean, we'll be very, very happy to lend a hand there and to, to help with the provider and then once it is ready, included in the in the downstream version of the migration token for virtualization. Nice, thank you. Um, two more questions, and then we'll get to your demo, and then even more questions after that. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, VM, what about VMware tools after migration? With all the recommendations, do you recommend cleanup of VMs prior to migration, like cleaning up your temp files, downloads, old programs, etc. We are, we are in this case, we are standing on the shoulder of giants. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's giants, but but we are we are standing on on a lot of of proven technology before. So there's a tool that comes with Red Hat Enterprise Linux that is called V2V, virtual to virtual. This tool was created to extract VMs from from VMware and put them into QMU or, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux or any other QMU supported environment. So it could be used to import into Ref, it could be used to import into uh, OpenStack, and we are leveraging it to import into OpenStack virtualization. So one of the things that V2V does is that it streams the disk, and while streaming the disk, it removes all the VMware drivers and tools. So whenever it re and adds the drivers necessary for the target, like the Virtio drivers, so whenever the, the VM arrives at the target, it will be booted and it will be put correctly because it has the right drivers. Nice, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go test out that tool myself later. So I mean, that's that's the command line version. If you want to have the, 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 the easy to use version, you could go for MTV because it's going to use that underneath. All right. Um, are there any benefits of using MTV over the VM import wizard available today when wanting to import just a single VM? Yeah, one of the things uh, we are planning to do, and I think it's going to be done, and I'm pretty sure that uh, that's going to be on a schedule, is that this migration token for virtualization is going to supersede the import tool. So the import tool is just for you to test one VM to import it. And there's code in the import tool that we are leveraging for the migration token for virtualization. The benefit is that you can plan this. You can plan it with the least of, of VMs. The other benefits that you're going to, whenever it goes GA, you're going to be able to check that the VM is, uh, doesn't have anything that will make it, uh, that will render it as unbootable or uh, unable to be, to be migrated before you migrate. So we're going to check that and then the third benefit that uh, we are we are working on delivering for GA in May uh, is that you will be able to do a pre-copy before doing the migration. So whenever you do the migration, you only have to copy the delta and reduce the amount of time necessary to do that that migration. 
So these are the benefits that MTDR bring, is bringing versus the tool that comes with OpenShift to import one single VM. Awesome, thank you. All right, let's see your demo and then we'll get back to some more questions. Cool, so OpenShift, OpenShift virtualization, right? So you have your OpenShift instance and uh, it's uh, OpenShift virtualization is supported on bare metal nodes. So you will need some bare metal nodes to have it supported, although you could enable nested virtualization like I do here. So things are going to go a bit slowly because we, we're going to be using nested virtualization, but I expect this to, to work properly. So this is our lab environment. This is uh, OpenShift uh, 4.7, as you can see here. This is the supported version. I can go to the installed operators and choose and choose all projects. And I will see that I'll have OpenShift virtualization operator installed and configured. So you have this OpenShift virtualization version 2.6.0 is the one we are testing on. So if you want to run on a tested environment, uh, then you should run a migration token for virtualization on top of OpenShift virtualization 2.6.0. So what do you need to do? Um, so you can install migration token for virtualization, the operator, and then you will be able to use it. So how do you use it? Well, I just can go this, uh, when you start it, you get like, uh, um, a project created, OpenShift-RHMTB. Uh, and if you go to networking for this project and you check on routes, there's a published route, which is the interface to the migration to for virtualization, which I have it open here. Yeah. So I let it load. This is the interface. Okay. So it's pretty straightforward. Once I've completed the migration, I could do a quick demo on how to install it. So I could go here and get it started. And this is like just deployed, okay? So first thing I need to log in. Mm -mm, I need to get the credentials. You have to log in as as a cluster administrator. So give me a second that I'm going to gather my credentials, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gathering my credentials. Give me a second, please, please, please. Log in. I'm logging in and I'm going to share my screen again. So sharing my screen in three, two, one. So I log in here. Is logging in. Okay, I'm I'm in Spain and the cluster is in Boston. So <laughs> expect, expect some delays while while running this demo. But uh, I mean, I've run it a couple of times and it worked well. So I can get started. I see the providers. This is the provider where the, the, the operator was installed and instantiated and it has found seven storage classes and it's completely ready. So I could add a provider now and I could select uh, VMware and just provide a name to it, vCenter, and then provide a host name, so our vCenter host name, provide a username, so administrator at vSphere local, then the password, I type the password, then the fingerprint, this is to ensure that we're connecting to the right <laughs> VMware provider and we're not connecting to something else. So once we do that, going to connect to VMware, I could go to providers VMware, it's going to check, if everything's okay, it's gathering the data. You see two clusters here, two hosts, 56 VMs, 13 networks, four data stores, and now it's ready. So we have the provider ready, the target provider, sorry, the source provider, and we have the target provider, OpenShift virtualization, both of them ready. So now we could create the mappings. I could go and create network mapping. So I create the mapping and I name it, you know, name it mapping network because I'm very original. <laughs> so I choose mapping network. I choose the provider, the source and the target. And now I have to choose the network equi equivalences. So I go on the source network and I choose the VM network. And then on the target, I select the pod network. And this is going to be my mapping. All my VMs are going to be attached to the VM network. And this is going to be reattached afterwards to the pod network. Okay, so I can just create the mapping. Okay, and this is the mapping that I have created. It's completely available for as many migration plans as I want to, to use. Then I could go to storage and create a mapping. 
same thing. And then I create the mapping storage mapping, select the provider, vCenter, select the target, host, and then I know that the, my VM is running on the NFS data store, but I mean, I could map the other ones. And I want to use the storage cluster Ceph RBD because I'm using OpenShift container storage here. So it's properly distributed, it's software defined, and it works really well. So I could create this map and I have the two maps ready. Now let's migrate. I go to migration plans, I create a migration plan, and I give it a name. So I'm going to call it MTB plan and description MTB. I check, I select the source provider, the center. I select the target provider, this host. And I love this. I mean, you could select a, a namespace and all the ones that are created, or I could type one MTV migrate. Okay. And if I click here, it will create for me this namespace. Okay. Good. Next. Then I'm going to filter the VMs. I'm going to choose this cluster which my VMs are running. And then I go into click next. And then it's getting all the list of VMs. So there's a lot of people working here. I'm going to filter the VMs by my name. And there we have. We have this Relate VM that is running that I'm going to migrate. I chose a small VM to make this migration quick so we could see it happening. So I select this VM. I could select like 20 VMs if I wanted to. No problem with that, or 30 or 100. And then I choose the network mapping, select this one. Next, I choose the storage mapping. You see, I could create a new storage mapping in case I was missing it here. Next, and then I review the result. These are the results. I'm going to migrate only one VM. I could migrate 100, but I'm going to migrate only one. And these are the mappings, and this is the plan. And I can click finish. And then Everything's ready to be migrated, right? So I could click start and the migration will begin. One of the things we are planning to add is to be able to schedule this uh, process. So you could say, okay, let's run it at three o'clock in the morning. Now that I've been running it like 20 times, I'm completely sure that it's running well. So let's get it running. This is the progress bar of the number of the VMs migrated. So in this case, it's only one. So it's going to go from this to, to green. and But we could check here, if we go to the details, that right now is in the transfer disk phase and it's copying the first gigabyte of data out of nine. So it's going to be copying and streaming the data and then it will convert the image to Kubefer doing all these transformations about the drivers that I mentioned and cleaning up tools. So when, when completed, it will be totally done. So this is not running. I could go to OpenShift, I could go to Overview, Projects, and then select the, the project that I just typed, MTV Migrate. And this is the project that has been created for me, wasn't here before. I can click on Details, Workloads, and then a VM will be created here in the Workloads, and I will be able to check on it. So let's give it a couple of seconds. Let's see how is this going. Still transferring disks. So it seems that this, you see the VM is already, the instance is already created. And now a disk is going to be attached and a network is going to be attached. And this VM is going to uh, complete the migration and will be running. So this is the demo. So far, we have to wait for it to complete. It's going normally takes around eight minutes. So if you want, you could shoot more, more questions. Um, keep going. I, I know I have a lot of questions, but wanted to wait until the end. So, uh, the demo oh, is up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's, it's, it's, it's that simple. <laughs> the thing is I, that, I guess I was like. It's, it's like well, super, super simple. I mean, uh, we have uh, our friends in user experience and design are working with us and are making things like super easy, super easy to understand and very well 
uh, uh, located, and then the engineering team is focusing on making it as uh, robust as possible. So um, we end up with these tools that are, as you see, like very simple and, and very reliable. So, so uh, amazing okay. demo. I mean, I just uh, I wanted it to keep going, but um, so one thing that I was wondering is at the beginning you mentioned analyzing your applications using the toolkit. Right, the migration toolkit for applications, and then using uh -huh. the MTV. So, how do those line up together? How does your planning? Oh, go that's into that's a great question. I don't know who mentioned it, but I, I love it. Look, we have in here it's called forklift. This is M, let's say that this is MTV, and in here we have uh, wind up. This is currently MTA. So these are the two tools that we have available. So in case you want to replatform and bring virtual machines to Kubernetes, you could use MTV. And let's say, okay, I'm moving uh, 20 VMs with uh, JBoss uh, Enterprise Application Platform to containers, and I want to turn those applications into, into something, uh, apply a strangler pattern and be able to turn them into microservices. Or I have them running in, in WebSphere or Tomcat, and I want to put them in containers. So there are a set of paths that MTA covers, the migration toolkit for applications, and what MTA is going to do is analyze the application at the application level. But what you can do is that you take the VM as it is in VMware and bring it to OpenShift. And then you already have all the developers working in OpenShift with an environment built for developers that developers enjoy and understand. You can manage it in, in a way in which you could manage all your environment uh, for cloud native applications, but with virtual machines to make the transition even smoother. So once the VMs with your web logic, let's say, they are running on your OpenShift virtualization, you will be able to take those applications and analyze them. And the thing is that what MTA does is pretty simple, you know, and I can run it for you. I have it here. So you just have to give it an application, it will analyze it, and it will tell you what do you need to change in the application to do the migration. So these are the two ways you could improve or or, um, or modernize your current status of your application portfolio with OpenShift and with the tools that we provide, with MTA and with uh, MTB. And there are two different paths, one of them is as I say, focus on applications, on improving the application and bringing it into a container uh, environment and to a cloud native world as, as as fast as possible, which is not a, normally a fast and easy way to do it. And the other one is just lifting and shifting the VMs to have all the applications in the environment that your developers want to use. So for that, I mean, you could go to red.ht slash MTA and download it. This is version 5.1 so far. So you just download the zip file and zip it, run the script as I just did, and then you will be able to run the migration token for applications, analyze your applications, and then this is what you will see. And you're getting two demos at the price of one. So <laughs> this is an application that I analyzed that is completely ready to run on JBoss CAP, whereas this other one has some web logic uh, proprietary uh, artifacts that need to be changed. I could dig down into this application, check the issues, and be able to check it. Look, I'm using the WebLogic proprietary logger, and I need to change it. So these are the two paths that you could follow. And normally you follow first migrating the VMs, then migrating the applications, although sometimes it makes more sense to do the application migration directly, depending on the status. But for that, I mean, you could count on, on our uh, consulting team, that they're always there to be able to do a discovery session and help uh, help the customers decide on what do they want to do, what is the best path, and how to get there. Did I reply to the question? Yes, yes, that was great. Um, and then we don't always want to say, hey, you have to use consulting, right? Um, no, no, I mean, uh, there are a lot of partners helping our customers doing these migrations too. And, and these partners are, as I say, they, they are like very skilled because they have been doing it for like a lot of time. And, and I mean, it's, it's a matter of, of the customer choosing 
how do they want to do this uh, this uh, modernization and how to get to this journey to the open hybrid cloud to to have a, a better to provide a better service for their own clients and to be able sometimes to expand their addressable market and be able to grow uh, faster so yeah if we could help our customers in that way we are always willing to do it thanks um I wanted to point out a great comment in the chat. Uh, a staggered, from a little bit earlier, a staggered schedule would be nice too. If I'm migrating 100 VMs, doing yeah, that. that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my my colleague Fabien, who is the engineering manager, is going to love hearing this because he's already thinking about how to establish some throttling and how to make this a scale to be able to move like a a large number of VMs. We're thinking like hundreds. Um, so yes, it's, it's, uh, it's something that is in our minds, but right now we have just released the beta and we keep adding features and that is one of the things that we keep in our minds to do for the future versions of the migration token for virtualization. Thanks for the comment, by the way. So and then there's, uh, are there any issues if, VMware, if the VMware environment is using VVols? VVols. <laughs> yeah. The, the VVOLs, uh, so far, what we have tested, if they behave, uh, there are like some corner cases there in which we 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 find some issues when um, obtaining the data from the VVOLs, but it's, it's very unlikely to happen, you know, because again, the way we are extracting the data from the VM is the same way a backup solution would do. And VMware wants their backup vendors to work well with their VVOLs. So, Normally, if there's an issue extracting data, it's a, a very weird corner case, or or is because there's something wrong with the implementation, but uh, of of the VVOLs, you know, because we're using the toolkit that the VMware provides to be able to extract the data from VMware, so we should be safe. So I know, um, I mean, myself, I feel that panic if I hear it should be safe, right? Especially when you're talking about data. So Yeah, if, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. That, you're right. I mean, that's why we follow the, the safest path. But I I for this I, I behave like an engineer, you know? If if I haven't tested like one million times, I'm not going to say it's safe. <laughs> but but I mean so, it's, it's as as reliable as any other backup tool. Which so is, I was going to ask how how do you, if there is an issue do you see the error right away how how oh, are yes. you notified of that corner case we are we are getting the I mean if if during the migration we get an error we'll see it here directly in the interface we are putting all that we can to be able to make the the error messages as clear and explanatory as possible that is key to be able to perform migration because one single migration VM that is not migrated would be a problem. And and then what we're doing is that right now we're releasing the beta as early as possible so people could start trying it and, and giving us feedback on the on these corner cases. And um and uh, the second part is that again we're working on having the 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 log for the or the error messages as clear as possible and to be able to gather all the logs together. So this is the direction we are heading. Of course, as I said, we are choosing the safest path. So right now, this beta, what it does is that it powers down the VM and then it starts copying the data with the VM power down. So the VM is in a consistent state and then it powers up the VM in the target, but it doesn't remove the VM in the source. So if there is any corner case that we forgot about that we couldn't find or that we are not aware of, you know, you can always Switch down the VM that you have just uh, migrated and power on the VM that is on the source. These ones are kept, and normally, what when we've done migration with customers, the initial migrations during the pilot phase before we scale, we keep these VMs and we do like a, a batch of tests to the migrated VMs to ensure that they are running perfectly. And then when those tests are completed and are verified, then is when we delete the source VMs. So normally there's a, 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 a period of time in which you keep the source VM as a way to be able to roll back, uh, just in case uh, something didn't work uh, as, as performed. But so far our experience is that whenever the VM gets completed and the transfer is completed, 
is, is it, it, unless there's a misconfiguration of networking, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it works as, as in the source and it works properly. So no, no concern about that. Thanks. I, Dan had a follow-up question, but I think you already answered it, um, but I'll say it anyway. So what if the source VM has snapshots? Will that foobar the migration? So if you're already bringing down the whole VM, um, oh, are you worried about the snapshots? Oh, this is uh, this is something um, and you got me. <laughs> I'm I'm not completely sure. The previous behavior is that we collapsed the snapshots, so we didn't have any issue with the snapshots. I mean, um, VMware is telling all the customers, look, don't use the snapshots for back backup. So if you have a snapshots, they should be able to be collapsed. We are working on not having to collapse the snapshots, but uh, right now I don't know the status of this, so I may need to uh, Miguel, follow up. Yes. Yeah, just just a quick note on that. Uh, we are not we are not deleting snapshots. So actually, it oh, was yes. in, it was in IMS 1.1 and start in IMS 1.2. We validated that it works without removing snapshots at all. So we kept on that line, and the snapshots are not a problem. From the VMware point of view, if the VM is down, uh, we're actually, uh, it's going to use the current state of the VM as a base to do the transfer. So whatever snapshots you have, you, you keep them. We're not removing them. And the current state is our, the, the, the image that we are moving. So even if you want to roll back, uh, you keep your previous snapshots. So if you use them as point in time for other rollbacks, you can continue to roll back even further in the past. Um, for one migration, uh, we are creating snapshots for change block tracking, but normally they shouldn't affect normal snapshots. It's something that we need to verify um, in with real virtual machines that we kind of try to break and see and see how it happens. Uh, but that's something on our test plan for the one migration. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Fabienne Dupont, our engineering manager for the migration to for virtualization. Thanks a lot, Fabienne, <laughs> for coming to the rescue. And if so, you want to stop sharing your screen, Miguel, then you can. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's going to take a bit more, some more minutes. So, yes, I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Because um, I'm really excited that you jumped on, Fabienne, too. Um, Thanks. Are, 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 I was listening so far. You you did very well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, we have a couple more questions. I saw that the distributed switch port groups during migrations, um, those networks are not an issue, correct? Distributed switch port groups. Dan, do you want to mm -hmm. ask live or if you're? They are not an issue. They are considered like any port group or tra traditional network. Um, the, the main difference, in our opinion, between a, a normal network and a distributed vSwitch or distributed port group is that uh, with a distributed port group, you don't have to configure it on every ESXi. Um, so it might be that some of the networks and the source don't exist on all the ESXi's when you are, have a traditional or legacy network. But if you're using distributed vSwitches, um, it's going to be automatically configured for you. But from our point of view, it's just another network on which you can have VLAN tagging, uh, MTU parameters, or whatever network configuration VMware has. So we, we already take care of them. Nice. That answered his question. Um, also, I mean, this is a great question, too. I was wondering this as well. So Mike asks, is the source VM still alive after the migration? Um, well, it's still alive, but sleeping. Uh, so we shut the, shut the VM down, uh, but the VM is not removed, as, VM, as Miguel explained. Uh, we keep it as a, as a backup plan. So if it, anything is wrong on the destination, you can still roll back. Your VM is there, and it's an easy rollback and really fast. That's why we keep it, we keep them. So are there any, have you run into issues as you're building out the tool with um, network contention or has anything accidentally stayed up and now you're worried about two things live? No, no issues? 
No major issues. Um, one thing we've noticed is that um, we've seen sometimes Windows machine not really appreciating to be migrated, uh, but usually it, it, well, trying the same VM from a different vCenter worked. Like it's, we, we considered more that than being uh, an environment issue in the in the test labs we have, rather than a VM or conversion issue on the V2V. Um, from a network contention point of view, uh, of course, the faster the network is, the better to, to reduce the downtime mainly. It's really a question of downtime. Um, we are doing our test in PSI, and um, it's not super fast environment because we are sharing the network with many other projects. Uh, so sometimes it's quite slow and well, the migration goes to the end. It works, it's just that you have to be patient. So yeah, we really advise to have a network um, benchmark before you start doing mass migration to have a clear assessment of what the platform can support. Uh, you also don't want to crash the network and uh, have an impact on, on running VMs or on backups because they are likely to use uh, the same the same v, the same storage uh, backend too. So if you, if we are two two processes reading the same disk at the same time, going to like probably slow down the backup, which is not a good idea if you want to keep your if you need to roll back. So general recommendations similar to doing backups, don't do it over your production network, right? Um, <laughs> I guess yeah. that's just a reminder. <laughs> um, all right, so we have a couple minutes, three minutes left, and there are questions around uh, OpenStack and Rev. So can the source be um, Rev or OpenStack, and is there a supported migration path? It will be. We're working on it. So let's say that for third quarter of this year, we, if everything goes beautiful and wonderful, we may be able to have Ref as a source. And then by the end of the year, we want to have OpenStack. So it's in the plan. It's, uh, we're already considering it. Uh, other providers like Hyper-V or Nutanix are not in, in the plan right now. However, if somebody wants to contribute that, we are more than willing to listen to them and to help them ramp up to be able to build it. So, that's that's more or, or less the, the roadmap, yeah. Or if you have a customer with, with some budget for engineering. Yeah, also, <laughs> which may happen. So again, go to conveyor.io, uh, and that's conveyor, K-O-N-V-E-Y-O-R.io. I hope I spelled that right. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm going to show you the, the website for a second, if I may. Perfect. Yes, please. We just uh, we just updated it recently, so you can have all the information here, all the projects rehost, uh, containers rehost, virtual machines replatform, measure software delivery performance, refactor applications to Kubernetes, and meetups that we do also that with uh, with uh, content on 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 real world example in many cases, in which uh, well we we invite people that to the community that are uh, especially in, in the field working with uh, with uh, customers that could provide hints and feedback on how to to perform a good migration and what to avoid and what to what are the good the best practices yeah all of the meetups that i've been to so far have been great i mean like you said real world examples so definitely recommend you know going to those virtual meetups right now. Right. Yeah, in, in in MTV we are in beta, so we're going to start rolling. And whenever we have uh, these run with customers for large migrations, I mean, I'm going to invite uh, whoever is involved to be able to share the experience. So, thank you. Well, thank you, and we're at time. And thank you again. That was a really great presentation, great Q and A, and. Definitely, we'll have you back uh, for a follow-on. So, Happy to be so here. Much.
and thanks to you for inviting us, Fabien for <laughs> saving me, and, and Chris for taking care of the of the of the back end of this uh, meeting. Yes, thank you, Chris. And if you want to see us out um, for everybody else that has joined us on Blue Jeans, Chris is seeing us out on OpenShift TV on the live stream. And thank you for joining us here for the live Q and A. And Again, thank you, Miguel. I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm gonna copy the questions so that you have them. And if you wanna follow up in the conveyor group on the Slack or however you wanna take care of the rest. Really appreciate okay. it. Yeah, all right, cool.